Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol, the president of the American Council on Germany, and I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion. Three days after Russia's invasion of Ukraine last February, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz addressed a special session of the Bundestag on Sunday, February 27th. In his Zeitenwende speech, he laid out a set of transformative and indeed ambitious measures for Germany's foreign security and energy policies. The speech was regarded as a major turning point for Germany and for the security architecture of Europe as a whole. A lot has happened since then, but there's also been some frustration that not enough has happened. And I am delighted to be joined today by ACG Young Leader alumna, Dr. Constanze Stelzenmüller. She's an expert on German, European, and transatlantic foreign and security policy and strategy. Constanze is currently the Fritz Stern Chair on Germany and Transatlantic Relations at the Brookings Institution, where she also directs the Center on the United States and Europe. Dear Constanze, Herzlich willkommen. Thank you. Lovely to be here. It is great to see you um, virtually. Uh, I wish we were doing this in person, but I hope we'll have an opportunity to do that uh, again sometime. Um, thank you again for, for taking the time from what I know is a really busy schedule to, to talk with us today. You know, one of the, the quotes that keeps getting cited over and over again from the Scholz speech is, that we are, are living in a watershed era and that this means that the world afterward will no longer be the same as it was before. And this is something that people seem to be coming back to over and over again. Um, when thinking about the Zeit and Venda speech, there's an awful lot to unpack, many levels that I'd like to, to at least touch on with you during the time that we have together today. But I thought we could start by looking at the domestic level um, how, in your opinion, how much has changed in German politics and in public opinion over the course of this past year since since the this stage of the war, since this invasion began, and since Scholz um, gave his speech? Well, first off, again, th thanks for having me on. Um, it's always lovely to be uh, to be back doing something with you, and and I have fond memories of my of my ACG trip, although I believe it was, it was one, it was went to Hamburg is one of the years when we were going to a place in Germany and the Americans came over. Um, on the changes in Germany, I, I personally, and perhaps I should explain, I live in Washington and I have done this since 2014. Uh, and the reason why I have the chutzpah to opine on these things is that I am in Germany every other month. Um, so I, I, I think I, I attempt to keep in touch. And my, my sense is that the changes are very real. Um, there is, I think, a sense of urgency, a sense of uh, that really this crisis, this uh, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine um, has upended the European security order and with it Germany's security dispositions. Um, and many of Germany's most cherished beliefs about itself about, and about the validity of its previous attitudes and dispositions. Um, so that's that despite some of the noise, despite some of the open letters and some of the demonstrations, I think is a fundamental transformational shift. The, the problem, I think, is that some transformations in Germany are easier to achieve than others. Um, and that's particularly true for defense. But I'm sure we want to come to that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, let's let's maybe parse that a little bit more because there's there's been um, some dissonance uh, both within the coalition between the coalition and the opposition. Um, there, I mean, you alluded to this. There have also been these these demonstrations. Um, you know, there, it's not possible, as with any country, to say the Germans all believe X or Y. Um, I would agree with you that 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 a um, trajectory was set with the Zeit and Venda speech. Um, some very, as as I said, sort of ambitious um, goals were laid out. They haven't all been fulfilled, nor would one have expected them all to be fulfilled within within a year. Um, how would you sort of rate how far Germany has come? So 
I think the shock uh, to the uh, to our perceptions of ourselves is very real, and I think that that is um, real across the board, um, regardless of the consequences that you draw. Um, I mean, you'd really have to live under a rock to to not be aware of just how um, serious a moment this is. Um, I think the place where the transformation has been the most dramatic, and, and I think we all know that, so um, forgive me if I'm saying something everybody knows, is in, in energy decoupling from Russian fossil fuel imports, um, where the, the traffic light government decoupled from coal by August of 22, um, from Russian oil by December of 22, and it was going to only decouple from Russian gas, which was thought to be much more difficult um, by the end of 2024, but the Russians preempted that by decoupling us. Um, so as a result, we were we came in on, on the decoupling targets ahead of time with some help from Putin. Mm -hmm. um, obviously that had a number of, um, shall we say unintended consequences or consequences that I believe were not fully considered such as the Germans hoovering up uh, scarce supplies of liquid natural gas around the world and thereby co contributing to the driving up of prices for a while, which didn't exactly make us popular with our neighbors. Um, there was, an, th then there were these massive 200 billion um, uh, buffer packages for industry and consumers to, to buffer the pain of the transition which again, were seen as a protectionist measure, understandably, by our neighbors. Yeah. Um, but the, that and a very mild winter has, 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 let, has allowed Germans to uh, basically fill up their storage capacity over the winter, um, to not have to um, endure any, any personal or industrial um, shortages. And, and you know, the industry did substitute to some degree and consumers did also contribute by saving. Mm -hmm. So the transformation was not just at the government level. I think those things really are significant, but we also, I think, now have to look quite hard at the, at the, uh, the unconsidered and unintended consequences of that transition. So, um, you know, you've, you've, Put a lot, lot out there, and so sticking with energy for just a moment. At, at Davos, um, Olaf Scholz talked about um, Deutschland Tempo um, when it came mm. to making this making this transition, and that that Germany really, on many levels, exceeded expectations in its ability to to wean itself off of uh, Russian energy sources. Um, you know, I I keep saying to people that I think it's a little ironic that it's taken the war. To get Germany to move forward as rapidly in its in its renewable targets, um, four or five years ago we were talking a lot about the Energiewende and everything that needed to to happen in order to move to renewables. Um, I feel like finally we're seeing some progress in that area. Um, but even last fall, there was some concern that next winter, the winter of 2023-24, would be worse and more telling than this current winter. Um, you touched on how mild this winter has been and that that's been a, an important factor. Do you have a sense that Germany is prepared for next winter or in the, the months until next winter that it will be able to be better prepared? Or is that sort of too premature? Steve, uh, I mean, I, I don't think I have any honest way of answering that question, right? Because that requires so many data points that I'm not in possession of. Um, and that perhaps the government is not in possession of. Nobody knows what the weather is going to be like. And I think everybody was surprised by how, how, how mild the winter ended up being. Mm -hmm. I remember being in Helsinki in, in late November, early December, um, and visiting Finnish icebreakers in, in the harbor. And um, the operators told us that they had actually gotten pr predictions of an unusually harsh winter. Um, so go figure, right? Um, but I think if, if last year has been good for anything, it is that we have shown ourselves that we can move really fast when we want to. I would prefer the chancellor and others to not take quite the sort of self-congratulatory tone 
um, in saying that um, because again of the of the the price that we imposed on others, including our neighbors, um, who are smaller, more vulnerable, and more exposed to Russian energy blackmail. Um, and, and I think that that is something that German politics doesn't do often enough, you know, looking over our borders and seeing what our policies um, do there. Mm -hmm. but, but on the whole, I think, I think we've, we've shown that we can move. And again, the, you know, the, 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 the other area which we're going to talk about, um, defense, you've seen 11 months of a German defense minister um, under whose aegis very, very little got done, mm -hmm. despite an astonishing um, freedom of action and, and promises of, you know, historic promises of funding from the government to get a transformation done. And now you see with the new defense minister, suddenly um, an astonishing amount of movement where previously nothing seemed possible. So um, I think to me, the lesson of the past year is, uh, you know, just we've learned we can get it done when we want to. And maybe the question really is one of will rather than of capability. Mm -hmm. Well, and so so that then raises another question about the the political will, particularly when it comes to some of these defense issues. Um, there was a, a radio interview this morning on Deutschlandfunk by um, Roderick Kiesewetter, the CDU defense um, polit. I don't think he's the spokesperson, but he's a defense expert in the in the okay. CDU. Um, and um, he was talking about the fact that the Zeit and Venda speech outlined some very good recommendations um, and suggestions for the path forward, but was critical that that not enough has been done um, as, as quickly enough. And certainly one of the criticisms has been um, that there is not a strong enough political will to move forward in the defense arena, both when it comes to um, Germany's defense infrastructure and, and the important investment in the Bundeswehr, um, but also when it comes to um, the delivery of um, arms to Ukraine, um, to a war zone, um, you know, there's there's a lot uh, that we both know in terms of German history and the reluctance um, of Germany to deliver tanks and weapons. Um, but it's taken a very long time for Germany to to reach that point where it's now delivering its Leopard 2 tanks. Um, can you say anything about sort of the, the hesitation and whether you think the political will is actually there? You know, I feel like I've been talking about nothing else for the past 12 months and probably the same is true of you too, right? There comes a moment when you seriously wonder whether you can still say anything that you haven't heard yourself saying 20 times before the past 12 months. Um, so to anybody out there who's listening to this, who feels uh, that he or she has heard this before, my apologies, this is just how it is. Um, the, I think there are a variety of things going on here. The thing that's, uh, let me start with the things that are not going on, okay? That I occasionally see Germany or this traffic light government or Charles himself accused of on Twitter, um, and that I think are unhelpful with a capital U, A, because they're wrong, and, and B, because they're defamatory. So no, they're not all Putin Fischtier. Um, No, they don't sympathize with Russia. Um, I think that, that the chancellor himself is one of those interesting Germans who started out their political lives as a young guy um, on the far left and then moved to the right of his party, which is still center left. Um, uh, because of, you know, a couple of, of, of learning processes. Um, some of Germany's most interesting politicians these days started off that way. Um, there are China experts in the European Parliament who used to be Maoists, you know, and who are today some of the most ferocious critics of Chinese policies. Um, so what I think is, is happening here is, is a number of, of other issues that I think compound each other um, to, to make for sort of incrementalism and hesitancy. Mm -hmm. I suppose if we, if we wanted to start with, with, a character, with leader character, um, it is true that, that the chancellor combines, I think, uh, a quite extraordinary caginess with a stubborn streak. 
And when criticized in public, um, the caginess and the and the stubborn uh, streak, um, I think, are exacerbated. Um, so uh, that may be the reason why the Biden administration um, treats him with with kid gloves, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's 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 one aspect here. The other aspect is, of course, cultural. You know, these are enormous shifts for Germany. Uh, enormous shifts for all the three members of the of the traffic wake uh, the traffic coalition, all of whom have had to publicly slaughter. You know, in the public square, some of them are taking cows, um, such as the you, you, the the aforementioned by you a prohibition on set on, on sending weapons to war zones. Um, that was an act, a law that had to be um, that had to be undone uh, very early on to enable Germany to send weapons to Ukraine, um, and it was something that the the, the center left in Germany, both the Social Democrats and the Greens, had fought long and hard to get on the books. Um, the liberals, who are often forgotten in this discussion, um, and who have a constitutional aversion to big government spending. Um, have essentially, you know, had to throw all that overboard and accept mm -hmm. enormous, enormous government subsidies to industry, to to consumers, and and ultimately to the to an, 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 a huge gift to the defense ministry, which is as yet un, un, unspent. Um, and this for a part party that wanted to bring down uh, bring down government debt. Um, and then, of course, for the Social Democrats, um, they have had to deal with their own history of Ostpolitik and 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 a relationship uh, with with Russia that that was in many ways highly problematic. I want to put a footnote to that and say, um, if you live in America as you and I do, Steve, um, one occasionally gets the impression that that is only a problem with the Social Democratic Party. Whereas actually there are Putin Fischteers and people who had for a re one reason or another embraced relations with Russia, with Russia in, in most of the parties. And of course the hard left and the hard right are officially Putin Fischteer mm -hmm. and, and, and parrot Kremlin talking points all the time. So I think sometimes the other ones get away with um, you know, being assumed to be more critical, whereas in fact uh, their record needs to be examined as well. And then finally, and then I'll shut up, uh, but to, to finish answering your questions about why this is all taking so long, there are of course structural reasons. And in the case of, of Germany's, what is called the Wehrverfassung, um, literally translated the defense constitution. In other words, the subset of constitutional and statutory legal rules and regulations that, that order the defense and security policy space, all of that was designed in 1955 when we had to stand up a national army again as a prerequisite for joining NATO. Um, all of that was designed in such a way as to maximize civilian oversight and to basically prevent any possibility of a disruptive transformation. And successive defense ministers have sort of broken their backs trying to, uh, trying to affect necessary changes. Um, it's always worth keeping in mind that we are, I believe on our ninth chancellor and our 20th defense minister. Uh, that shows you just how complex that job is. Mm -hmm. And so, are you are you somewhat optimistic that this will now be the time of making those necessary reforms in the Bundeswehr? Uh, yeah, yes and no. I mean, I believe uh, I I think a lot of those structural impediments are still in place, and something needs to be done about that. Um, I sense that Pistorius is the first defense minister in quite a while. Uh, who who knows that and who wants to do something about it and has the necessary energy and determination. That said, he he needs to start with his own ministry. Um, he needs to have basically a an enforcement um, unit in inside his ministry and inside the armed forces that helps him do that. One defense minister cannot do that uh, when faced with with such an en en entrenched array of forces of inertia. So he needs two Staatssekretärs, state secretaries. The, uh, in English, it would be the permanent secretary in the defense minister. Those normally are the people who, you know, do the do the shovel work uh, of of admin, of running the, the the ministry and the armed forces. Then he, I think it is there is some consensus that he's going to need a new chief of um, general staff. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there is some debate around whether he needs to bring back a policy planning staff, which was um, abolished about a decade ago, um, and instead of which the, the defense ministry created a, its own political department. Um, and finally, I think he just needs to blow up defense procurement. Um, well, so I was going to say, isn't isn't the, frankly the biggest issue on the table yeah. the the whole right. procurement issue, um, given the the need that the Bundeswehr has for uh, equipment that actually is is up is modern and functional. Yeah, um, I mean, I have seen a number of people try and do that, um, and I and I think it really requires. Um, that requires an across the board political effort, an understanding that the way things are organized now, they're, they're, they're organized for peacetime during the Cold War, right? Mm -hmm. but, but have not been significantly reformed since then. And so with all the, you know, all the, the changes that I've just suggested in the, in the upper echelons of the defense ministry, I think what, what the minister needs most of all is support from his own party, from his legislative group in the Bundestag and from his own chancellor. And very often, some of the best defense ministers have been, you know, foiled by their own chancellors. Yeah. Ultimately, that is where, you know, that is where the authority rests to make those changes. And I think that if Pistorius doesn't receive Schultz's full support for that, and if they don't corral the, the, the legislative group of the SPD, which, as we know, is run by the left wing of the SPD, um, then, then I think this will prove to be very difficult indeed, or rather, I mean, a fool's errand. Mm -hmm. Constanza, one of our, our viewers is is curious to know a little bit more about how this war is actually serving as a catalyst to help the the German armed forces become stronger and better prepared to defend Europe. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that that. And you and I have talked about this before, that there's been sort of a sense of complacency, um, a sense of we're not going to see war on the European continent. And so things were allowed to slide. Um, with the war in Ukraine, um, there's a heightened awareness and really a recognition of the poor sort of state of affairs of the of the Bundeswehr. Mm. So let me let me just say a word in defense, okay, of of the Bundeswehr here, which I think a lot of American listeners, um, you know, may may not be fully cognizant of, and that's you know no no fault of their their own, um, and it's something that I described in 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 a recent column um, of mine in, in the in the Financial Times. Um, people forget, or never knew, um, that the Bundeswehr when it was stood up again in 1955. Remember when we wrote uh, a basic law in 1949 in West Germany, it didn't contain armed forces. We were never supposed to have those again. Mm -hmm. And it was when the allies realized that they were going to need us to defend the intra-German border and the, and, the iron, and the iron curtain from the, from the Western side against the Soviet incursion, that we were asked to stand up um, 12 div divisions, half a million men uh, within very short order. And this in a country whose male population had, had been decimated by the war uh, it had started. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the generation of my parents rioted in the streets in the, in the mid 50s um, against this because they thought this was leading them into yet another war. Uh, nobody wanted to do that. And, and as a result, throughout the Cold War, we had an, a Bundeswehr that was uh, very armor and infantry heavy whose main purpose was going to be to defend the intra-German border of 1,700 kilometers for three weeks until the onset of nuclear warfare, by which time we would be a smoldering peep of ashes and things wouldn't matter anyway, right? Um, that created, in my view, also a certain you know, psychological disposition in German pacifism that people also, I think, you know, don't quite understand how, what an impact that had on say people like me who were growing up in the shadow of, of, that, um, of that scenario. Um, and then in 1989-90, um, Thomas Bagger, who is now, um, who used to be director of policy planning in the foreign ministry and is now ambassador in Warsaw, wrote a famous piece in the Washington Quarterly 
um, about how Germany misunderstood the 1989 moment, the fall of the wall and the reunification as a validation um, of its strategy of atonement and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. um, and and misunderstood it also as as permitting it, as it were, to disarm mentally and and absolutely physically as well. I remember as a young journalist in the 1990s um, being sent to you know party conferences uh, of the Social Democrats, especially where where some of the the line items on the agenda were abolish NATO um, in favor of OSCE, right? And, and then, of course, 9-11 happened, and, and we were all told in no uncertain terms by, by NATO and by, and by Washington, the Bush administration, to abolish our, our um, land-heavy armed forces and create expeditionary, um, small, very highly professionalized, very mobile expeditionary forces. And something I've forgotten, by the way, in 1989-90, the one thing that also got reunified was the two armies. Right. So suddenly the German armed forces were, were West Germany plus East Germany, um, which were, if I remember correctly, just short of 900,000. So part together. Um, and so, um, of course, you know, that was downsized and mostly on the East German side, it has to be said, but not just. It was also downsized on the West German side. Our armed forces are now, I think, just short of 185,000. So we went from we've went from about you know six hundred thousand or six hundred fifty thousand on the West German side at the at the height of the Cold War to now one hundred eighty five thousand. That is an, a huge shift to digest. And now with this this Russian um, aggression war of aggression against Ukraine, suddenly we are rediscovering um, deterrence and defense of um, not just of NATO territory and the homeland, but also of our periphery against Russian aggression. That in other words, the, the whipsawing that has been going on over, over the history of the alliance has, I think, hit no, no army, uh, no armed force harder than the German one. And that's part of the, um, and we, I think we mainly have been running after change for decades rather than trying to get ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about the current defense minister is that he appears to be genuinely desirous of changing that, as, by the way, um, Lambrecht's predecessor, AKK, Annegret Kamkarenbar, tried to do, yeah. but was foiled, not least by her own chancellor. Yeah, I mean, I think just to to do a deep dive into both the history of the Bundeswehr, but also yeah. some of these these sort of zigzags, if you will, in, in policy mm -hmm. is fascinating. I mean, one of the um, positive side effects, as I learned last week from a, a Bundestag member of the merger of the Volksarmee from the GDR and the Bundeswehr, was that after Russia, Germany now has the, the biggest collection of, of MiG fighter jets and parts, which are proving to be proving to be useful um, for Ukraine. I saw the, the Luftwaffe Try, trying those out for then Defense Minister Struck uh, when I was uh, when I was still a journalist for the side in the early two thousands um, in the in the Rostock Lage Air Base, which used to mm -hmm. be in East Germany, um, and um, the Luftwaffe was absolutely thrilled to get its hands um, on on these on these planes, which were legendary. The problem with the MiG, of course, is that. A fully fueled MiG can stay in the air for about 45 minutes, right? It doesn't exactly have a big radius, and it is made for air-to-air -air combat, if I recall correctly. Um, and that's not what we're what, what we're trying to do here right now. Right. Um, and and so what you really need to do is is um, you know tactical. What, what we really need, and Ukraine really needs, is tactical aviation to protect ground operations. Um, but anyway, that's that's on another. The, that that's the, that's that's another story. So the MiGs are a nice plaything, play uh, and and thrilling to the Luftwaffe as an acquisition, but hugely yeah. expensive in terms of their fuel uh, um, their 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 fuel requirements and upkeep. So the the procurement issue, you know, obviously is is an important one um, for Germany, but also for Europe as a whole, um, and also having a more integrated military across European countries. One of our viewer points out that that Poland is is positioning itself to ramp up its military um, significantly in the, the coming months and years. 
Um, and then it looks like they are going to procure mainly from the United States and South Korea. Um, do you think that that has uh, large implications for having a more coordinated EU armed force? So I don't think we're going to have an EU armed force per se. Uh, yeah, let's let's unpack the different levels of this. Um, I think the uh, the observation, which is by now quite trite, is that we uh, would be in a very, very different place without uh, the Biden administration's leadership and, and really muscular mm -hmm. uh, leadership of, of the Western response against, uh, against Russian in, Russia's aggression. Um, and that both in qualitative and quantitative terms. The, it's also true to say that the EU has responded in a surprisingly muscular way, mm -hmm. including by providing common funding for military acquisitions. Yeah. That a year ago would have been completely unimaginable, right? Um, but I don't think anybody, even the people who years ago were talking about uh, an, an EU army, uh, that includes the current EU commission president, Ursula von der Leyen, are doing that now. Right. What we are doing, though, what everybody is doing, I think, is looking very closely at the um, at U.S. opinion polls and at the battle inside the GOP over um, over support of a Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And you could also see at the Munich Security Conference that both you and I went to um, GOP senior leadership, including the Senate minority leader, Mitch McConnell, very, very deliberately and publicly ring fencing the Ukraine issue against uh, their own MAGA wing back in in the House in in the United States, um, but but you know I was at the at this the the Bavarian government's transatlantic forum the CSU's transatlantic forum that is traditionally held just before the conference opens, and heard McConnell say I, I believe two times very carefully I represent most Republicans, and I do wonder um, whether whether his German audience was willing to hear that word most. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the question for all of us is not, do we, are we, do we want to chase after pipe dreams of European autonomy or pipe dreams of an e, EU army? I believe that to be um, pretty much laid to rest at this point. But how do we create a, um, a credible European-based defense and deterrence capability that in the context of NATO that contributes to greater burden sharing, contributes to a division of labor with uh, a United States that might just be distracted by other conflicts, right? Um, but, but that in, in case of a turn in American politics against Europe would be able to, to credibly defend Europe and Ukraine against a, a, a Russia that continues to be near imperialist and aggressive. Mm -hmm. since, uh, since we're talking about um about the war and about equipment, one of our viewers just submitted a, a question asking how you see the role of technology uh, in the conflict in Ukraine playing out and, and what future it might have. Um, on the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference, uh, we, we hosted an event where we had um, some speakers from the State Department, but also from private sector companies like Palantir and Microsoft. And we were basically talking about how, you know, on some levels, this is a, a World War I type atmosphere with trench warfare, but at mm -hmm. the same time, um, data algorithms, software, um, misinformation, and, and cybersecurity or cyber warfare play a huge role um, on the battlefield as well. Have you had a chance to sort of think at all about this sort of technological dimension? Look, I'm not an expert on 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 the uh, on on this aspect of the field, and certainly not on the on the digital di digital aspect. Um, so I'm I'm going to answer, if you'll forgive me, with a, with a, with something of a generality. Um, it you know, it's it's this is something that both has happened and hasn't happened. I mean, the, the Ukrainians have clearly gotten exquisite support from government actors and from private corporate actors um, to defend themselves and in the form of real-time intelligence, including targeting intelligence. Um, and that, that I think has played a crucial role in, in their efforts, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's also not quite true, as was surmised for quite a while, that there have been no cyber attacks from the Russian side against Ukraine or against NATO. There have been. And the New York Times just this weekend had had a report about a massive cyber outage in Albania, which is um, attributed to Iran. Um, but given the fact that Iran currently is the only non-Western power openly supporting Russian efforts with weaponry, I wouldn't be surprised if there were linkage there. But that, I mean, again, I'm speculating here. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the, the lesson from all this, right, is, is that we need to consider both things. The, the return of nasty, you know, brutal World War I type kinetic warfare of a kind that we thought we had both culturally and in technological terms overcome. Um, and and, and the, but that, that at the same time has very significant digital hypermodern aspects that we also need to master. So the, 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 I think the conclusion for ourselves as we consider uh, NATO defense and deterrence, and I think an important point that you and I haven't made yet here is that as we have given um, as we have given advanced heavy weaponry to, to Ukraine, we have depleted our own stocks of that to zero. Yeah. I have just, um, after Munich, I went to Copenhagen and then returned from there to the US. And the Danes have given all 19 of their Caesar anti-aircraft guns um, to, to, to Ukraine, leaving zero. Mm -hmm. And that's a stunning realization, right? We are literally leaving our own deterrence and defenses uncovered on the assumption that, that attacking NATO territory outright currently is a red line that, that Putin has respected so far. Uh, my, personal, you know, my, 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 my personal estimate is that he will continue to do that because it's, it would, uh, I think, land him in extremely hot water that if, if, he, if, if he walked over that red line. But honestly, it's not a situation that we should care to be in and one that we ought to be able to remedy as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. But so when and when we do that, to just to sort of tie this up, when we do that, we have to look not just to the hardware and to our relationship with the defense industry in, in replenishing that and keeping it replenished, but also to very often the, the fairly dismal uh, state of affairs of our digital capabilities, which, which within the alliance are, are, you know, diverge widely uh, in, in terms of sophistication. Um, and, and availability. So sort of switching, switching gears a little bit, I mean, I think one of the, the big debates that's been playing out over the past few months has been how one defines victory and defeat um, in, in all of this. And coming back to, mm -hmm. to Scholz again, there have been a number of, of comments made about his sort of apparent refusal to say that Ukraine should win Mm. Instead, he's been indicating that Russia must fail in his in its invasion. Um, mm. There was one quote I picked up that he said it's it's about Ukraine being able to defend its independence, its integrity, its state sovereignty, and its freedom. Um, why why do you think he is so reluctant to talk about a Ukrainian victory per se? Again, I, I don't think it's because he wants the Russians to win, as is occasionally suggested on Twitter. I think that's ridiculous. Um, but um, I mean, let, let, let me put it very bluntly. I've written this, but I want to say it here. I disagree with the chancellor and for that matter with the Biden administration on this question of being prudent versus pushing. In mm -hmm. other words, the, the um, as we say in German, Güte Abwägung, the, the uh, what do you, how do you call that in English, Steve? Um, the weighing, the weighing of the odds and yeah. pros and cons. Weighing, weighing the odds, yeah. Yeah, weighing the odds of, of two strategies. Prudence for the sake of avoiding an escalation, either horizontal into other, other countries or vertical to prescribed weapons like nuclear weapons. Um, and versus a push which would enable Ukraine to regain um, control over its own sovereign territory um, in order to avoid exhaustion, both exhaustion of Ukraine's forces, but also exhaustion of Western consensus, um, which I think is, is, is also a very important consideration. And so I, 
I, I just want to say here that I have respect for every Western leader, including Biden and Schultz, who says, I owe it to my voters and I owe it to my country to, to let prudence guide my actions and my decisions, mm -hmm. right? I, th I think that that is, is genuinely a virtue and, and one that I respect. W what I take issue with is the calculus that, that, that leads them to, to prudence rather than to supporting a push, right? I, I think that the, the risk of, of loss of, of momentum and that the risk of loss of democratic consent in a war that takes longer um, is, is very significant and is not, uh, is not considered often enough. And if I hear stories, and, and again, these are allegations made, made in the media, like there was a Spiegel story that, that quoted at length uh, people around the chancellor and the chancellor himself calling um, critics of, of, of the prudent strategy bellicists. Um, when, I hear, when I hear that, and, and it sort of matches other reporting, then, um, it, you know, it, I find that concerning because if you're, if you're sticking that kind of label onto your critics, mm -hmm. it suggests to me that there is something true about the critique. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. And, th and and so I, I think that's a debate that has yet, yet to be hashed out. Um, and I think that the transfer's refusal to speak of Ukrainian victory is part and parcel of that prudent strategy. Mm -hmm. It's notable that Defense Minister Pistorius is is now speaking very openly uh, that or saying very openly that Ukraine has to win. Right now, yeah. you can still you can still discuss what does winning mean in this context, um, and I think you can have a rational and 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 um, respectable debate about whether to make a distinction between mainland Ukrainian territory and and control over Crimea, right? Mm -hmm. um, for the simple reason that Crimea is in in is in significant ways better defended. Um, than other parts of the mainland territory now held by Russia. Um, but I think it, it has to be, it has to be the Western position that Ukraine has every right to regain all the territory belonging to it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And, and that, we, that, that if we make distinctions in, in eventual negotiations about an armistice and peace, those negotiations will be prudential um, and will be made under the reservation that Ukraine is, is considered the sole legitimate owner, uh, sovereign over these territories. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was being somewhat legalistic here, but you get my drift. No, I mean, I think, I think that's perfect because it also sort of is a nice tie-in to, to one of the next questions I wanted to ask you about, which is um, sort of whether or not you think there's a, a common western view of what winning looks like i mean one of the the things that i came away from the munich security conference thinking was that you know there's there's from the main stage a sense of strong solidarity mm -hmm. anything that it takes will provide support to ukraine um but in smaller sessions and in the hallways a lot of hand wringing about um what the future looks like how one defines a victory for Ukraine, how one um, would perceive a defeat, uh, and then also concerns about the timeline and that time is not is not in Ukraine's favor at the moment and that this needs to be addressed more quickly. Do, do you have a sense that there's a, a common Western view? No, of course not. I mean, it's it's there are differences within the Biden administration. Right. There are different differences uh, across the line on, on many of the key issues, and that's completely legitimate. Right. Um, I think, you know, you get unitary views in North Korea um, and probably not even there. Um, so so I, I don't have a problem with with Western democracies or the Western alliance having uh, having views, uh, divergent views here. And um, I'm I'm relatively relaxed about that because that's normal. And, mm -hmm. and again, all these all these points of disagreement are, are legitimate. I think uh, where I get nervous is when people start calling each other's other names and and as it were delegitimizing each other's stances uh, by by calling into question their personal motivations. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
again, as soon as you, you know, as soon as I'm being called a Kriegstreiber um, or a Bellicist, which is the which is the fancier uh, sort of people version for people who had Latin in high school or in gymnasium, right. uh, I I sort of raise an eyebrow and I wonder how secure people really are of their arguments, right? That's not something I would do. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you know, much is made of a supposed difference of, of view between West Europe, uh, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, and while it's certainly true that the threat perception and, and the sort of desired responses sort of east of Germany um, are for all the obvious reasons, location baby um right. are are sharper um i was in lisbon before the munich security conference and was fascinated to be told that um i reminded and, and that that the that uh, opinion polls for support of ukraine are among the highest in europe and portugal but but i'd always wondered why and and a senior diplomat explained to me that you that a large number of Ukrainians emigrated to Portugal after the dissolution of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, 80,000. And they have integrated well, they speak Portuguese, they have Portuguese passports. Um, and so that, that, makes, that, that makes for a significant minority. And Portugal has now also taken in 50,000 refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, with a population of 10 million, that's really significant. Add that to, to Portugal's sort of traditional Atlanticism, and that sort of puts paid to the to the theory that the farther west in Europe you go, you know, the the more disinterested people will be in these issues. And it and it also shows you that that the mobility of of people um, over over the past decades is a really significant factor in the way that people feel about Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. So I I honestly you know I I am I I I tend to be I, I tend to think, but while we need to examine the legitimate differences of opinion, we shouldn't get get too hung up on them. Yeah. So look, looking ahead, um, you know, there has been a lot of discussion about um, a security guarantee uh, if Ukraine starts peace talks with Russia. Mm -hmm. um, it's been something that's been reported in in the media. Um, one of our viewers is is interested to know how strong um, German public opinion calling for more German action on negotiations is mm. uh, impacting Scholz's position and and his policies. Um, but someone else also is curious to know what sort of the situation might look like after the fighting stops with regard to, Ukraine's entry to NATO, to the EU, and and mm. reconstruction. Yeah, so you know all of these are monumental questions, right? Uh, which I personally tend to think are quite far off. Mm -hmm. I at this point don't see, um, I don't see a credible Russian willingness to negotiate. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The Russians keep saying publicly that they will only negotiate at the price of a complete submission and, and you know, national obliteration of sovereign Ukraine. That's not a condition Ukraine can accept, particularly you know, not if, you, if you take into account the horrific war crimes and crimes against humanity that, that have taken place in, that, that have happened in, in places that Russia has either occupied or captured. Um, and I don't see, you know, I, I I don't see a basis for negotiations at this point. Mm -hmm. That's not to say we shouldn't be thinking about them. That's not to say we shouldn't be thinking about the construction of a future European security architecture after um, both sides have, have come to the conclusion that it is not worth their while to continue fighting. But again, I think the main condition here is that, is that Russia has to come to a point where it sees that this is a war it cannot win. You know? And where considering we're continuing to fight would be potentially catastrophic for it. Um, note the things that I'm not saying, right? I'm not saying, you know, we need to sort of divide Russia into into fiefdoms or there has to be regime change. 
uh, that kind of loose talk to me is, is you know, profoundly unhelpful uh, to the current situation. Um, I'm, I mean, a lot of things can happen in Russia after a, after a, a loss to Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is any and all of these scenarios come with significant risk to European security. Mm-hmm. And I would say, um, and I think there are a lot of people in, in the Biden administration who understand this, with significant um, risks to American interests in Europe, mm-hmm. which go well beyond this conflict, right? Um, and so I think the, the thing to consider at this point is whether we shouldn't try now to work on security guarantees for Ukraine sort of sub-NATO Article 5 level uh, on designing a Ukrainian reconstruction that puts it on a trajectory to EU membership, which is what it has been promised, I believe sincerely. Um, And to, I think, understanding that that this process needs to start while Ukraine is still at war. Mm -hmm. It is would be very unlikely, I think, for Ukraine to join the EU, or much less NATO, during the war. But I think we need to start the process of transformation. Mm-hmm. And it seems to me, you know, we all, we all know of the sort of imperfect democratic structures and, and the economic corruption, et cetera, et cetera, that, that beset Ukrainian democracy before the war. But we've also seen an astonishingly resilient and courageous civil society and government. Um, and, and I suspect that this war has been less than happy for Ukrainian oligarchs. So I would think that this would be actually be the moment to help Ukrainians achieve a democratic transformation that deserves that name by helping them design governmental structures that will pass you know, the test of transition from wartime to peacetime. Yeah. I'm doing that now. So as we as we start to to come to the close in our conversation, I'd like to bring it back to to Germany again, and and this question of um, whether you think German public opinion is um, is really affecting Scholz's position as he tries to push either for negotiations um, or see some sort of a resolution for the war? How, how much is Scholz actually listening to okay. the German public? Right. Your, your listener had, had asked to, or, or your viewer had asked about German public opinion. And honestly, um, having, having run a, a transatlantic opinion poll for, for the German Marshall Fund for two years, the transatlantic trends, um, until 2014, I, I would say, you know, if you look at polling, you have to look extremely carefully at the formulation of the questions and at the methodology, right? And, and the thing that I would always point you to is the development of in, in German polling before and after the Leopard decision, right? Before the Leopard posi- uh, decision, I think the chancellor was encouraged in his prudence by a, um, by a question that had a plurality of 46% saying we should send the Ukrainians the, the Leopard tanks and um, 43% that said we shouldn't. Yeah? That's basically a divided electorate. Right. After decided to do so, the numbers of the, the, the number of those supporting the decision went up to 54%, right? That shows you that there is a space for, for principled leadership yeah? and, and that people appreciate that. And the other data point that I would, that I would adduce here is the fact that Boris Pistorius has, in very short notice, become Germany's most popular politician, simply by by putting, you know, by 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 employing sort of very concise, clear, and empathetic language you know, in ways that that people I think appreciate um, and find attractive, because while he is not in denial about the difficulties of his job, um, he's being He's he's showing you know he's showing energy and determination, and a certain degree of gumption, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And that and I think that appeals to people, and I think therein too lies lies a message from the chancellery if they want to hear it. So I'd, I'd like to to conclude with with a question that comes from from one of our viewers here in New York. Um, it's it's sort of a two part question. 
But the headline is, how will domestic political shifts and economic realities in Germany affect the trajectory of the Zeitenwende in the near to mid term? Is the German military shift and its support for Ukraine going to be secondary to the SPD's poor performance in the Berlin elections and the fact that German economic growth is lagging behind the rest of the EU? Um, God, you know, I mean, the SPD has just come out by by 53 votes ahead yeah. of the Berlin election. Um, to me, the, the larger story of the Berlin election is the disaster that was the previous election, right? And the disaster that was the administration of the nation's capital, right? Yeah. Uh, and which I think is on the SPD to very large measure, and if, if not only on it. Um, there have been conservative Bürgermeister. But um, the other thing I think to note is that, um, as always with, with these data, it's a question of how you frame them, right? Mm -hmm. um, six months ago, the expectation was that we would be in a, in a savage recession, uh, which it turns out we're not, right? right. Our, you know what? Our growth rates are actually just fine compared with what we were worried about. Gas prices are down again to pre-war uh, pre levels or below that, and inflation is down. I mean, come on, right? We have actually done quite well and with considerable luck, helped by Putin and by mild weather. But still, we also showed that we, we can do something. So I, I you know, my, my position on this is, um, I would prefer people not to moan and just to get on with it. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. That's a, a good place to close. Um, Constanza, I want to thank you again for, for taking the time to be with us. Um, there is a lot to get along get on with. Um, obviously, it's a, a full agenda, and we'll be following it closely, as I know you will as well. So, herzlichen Dank. Good to see you, well. and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Yeah, and thanks for everybody who listened, and thanks to you from ACG uh, for organizing this. It's really lovely to see you. Okay? Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye.